Hello, I'm Maureen Reedy, the president and CEO of the Paley Center for Media, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this very special Paley Front Row presented by City Programs, celebrating ABC's The Wonder Years. This event is a centerpiece of the Paley Center's annual celebration of Black History Month, a salute to Black achievements in television. Throughout the month, we will be honoring the incredible legacy of the Black performers, storytellers, musical artists, sports figures, media titans, and newsmakers who've broken ground across television history. Our celebration includes a host of immersive experiences, including a must-see interactive exhibit at the Paley Museum in Midtown Manhattan that features costumes, set pieces, props, and show memorabilia from acclaimed series, including The Wonder Years, Queen Sugar, All American, Saturday Night Live, and Blackish. We are proud to honor the Wonder Years as it continues the cherished tradition of creative achievement. This series is a wholly original reimagining of the revered 1988 to 93 coming of age family comedy that has taken its place as one of the most celebrated new programs of the year. As its predecessor had throughout its original run, the series deftly follows its central character as he navigates his evolution from childhood to adulthood with all of its milestones, best friendships, first loves, family misunderstandings, and more. Brilliantly executive produced by Lee Daniels and Saladin K. Patterson and set in Montgomery, Alabama circa 1968, The Wonder Years is a richly drawn portrait of a black middle-class family in the civil rights era and blessed with a gifted ensemble of actors led by Dulé Hill and Sekong Senblo, nuanced writing filled with humor and heart and sterling production values, the series has taken a cherished TV classic and made it vital, fresh, and completely new. Before we begin our program, I'd like to offer our sincerest thanks to our presenting sponsor, City, for their generous support in making our celebration of Black History Month possible and for joining the Paley Center as we continue our commitment to increasing awareness and educating the public on the importance of diverse representation on television. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce and welcome our moderator, Makisha madden Toby, staff editor at TV Line. Makisha is a seasoned television critic with over two decades covering TV, has written for publications including Essence, Variety, the LA Times, and People. And we are so pleased to have her joining us for this special program today. Over to you, Makisha. Welcome to the Paley Front Row, presented by City. I'm Makisha madden Toby, TV Line staff editor, and I'm delighted to be your host for this special Black History Month conversation celebrating the Wonder Years. Today, we are thrilled to welcome the members of the series' gifted cast and creative team, Joining us are Dulé Hill, who plays Bill Williams, Saquon Sanglo, who plays Lillian Williams, and Saladin K. Patterson, showrunner and executive producer. Welcome to everyone watching. Please don't forget to subscribe to the Paley Center's YouTube channel at the link below. Let's start our program. This question is for everyone. Right. As this conversation is a part of the Paley Center's salute to more than eight decades of Black achievement on television, can you reflect on a show or a personality who inspired you? We can ask Saquon first. She can go first. Ladies first. <laughs> Ladies first. You know, um, I must say, a friend of mine, we were just talking about 227. And we yes. were talking about um, uh, Jack A. Harry's character mm -hmm. uh, on 227 and also uh, Marla Gibbs. Mm -hmm. um, I love that show so much. And I loved how Sandra, she was just kind of... <laughs> Into the plays and she, uh, you know, I just always, <laughs> I love that character. For any of the younger watchers who've never seen 227, you also see a young, beautiful Regina King on that show. Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful series. Marla Gibbs is like the queen of sitcom. Her comedic timing, uh, like I just, I love the women on that show. So I will, I will shout out uh, 227. <laughs> and nice. Dulé? But myself, I'd have to go with uh, a different world. Kadeem Hardison, I love the Wayne Wayne. I love the character. I love the entire cast of that world. I mean, uh, it really was a different world to see us on television in that way. And it drew me in. I look forward to it every week. <laughs> For me, um, let's see. I was Someone wrote down what I'm supposed to answer. Um, <laughs> Lay, Lay Hill <laughs> on the West Wing um, and Dule Hill uh -huh. on Psych. <laughs> and Dulé Hill on Ballers. 
Um, yes. <laughs> All of those things. Hey, Sal didn't write scripts, but he also can read scripts too. <laughs> 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 um, then Dulé was great on all those things, including the one the years. Um, but you know, I'll say in terms of individual, I think Eddie Murphy was probably the first um, entertainer that kind of made me, at that time, made me wish I could do what I saw him doing in terms of making people laugh. You know, he felt, you know, um, I know he was following in the footsteps of Red Fox and Richard Pryor, and you know, Flip Wilson, and, and the kind of the. The, um, the trails, they had blazed, but he really, I think from my generation, he made comedy very relatable and, and accessible, um, but still felt kind of fresh. Um, but then in terms of TV shows, um, I would probably say Sanford and Son um, was one that probably had an early influence on me. Um, I wasn't even aware of it at the time because I had no idea I would, I would pursue this um, as a profession, but just the, um, you know, Sanford and Son was a very black show. Um, and it was unapologetically black and Red Fox, you know, the fact that he used all his comedian friends and the characters they created, um, you know, it, 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 it just left an impact on me in terms of, you know, a wide audience accepting something that wasn't trying to cross over or anything, you know, like Red Fox was just unapologetically Red Fox. Yeah. And it was set in Watts. So exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, <laughs> you know, look, here's the thing is, is I think I need to add to that, too. In the midst of all of the controversy of it all, and you have to still. You got to say the Cosby show. You have, yeah. to, you have to acknowledge the Cosby show. Yeah. You have to acknowledge you what, have to. you know, Bill Cosby, Felicia Rashad, Malcolm Jamal Warner, Keisha Knight Pullum, you know, mm-hmm. they all, you know, they did brought such lovely work and inspiration every week in and week out. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, you can't mention Different World without mentioning the Cosby Show because right, that's true. Awesome. Exactly. I, I, I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> this I next mean, question Bonet, is for... I mean, come on, Lisa Bonet. I mean, right. come on. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we probably like her for different reasons, but yeah, she's okay. <laughs> <laughs> she was I love awesome Lisa too. Bonet. I was going to say, she just was giving rebel vibes. Yes. I want to say Lisa Bonet was probably the first time I saw a woman rocking dreadlocks on yep. a main screen. Mm a mainstream television show. I was like, what? She wearing her hair natural? Mm-hmm. Like, I was like, <laughs> I was shocked. <laughs> and I loved it. Yeah, that was awesome. This next question is for Saladin. What was the inspiration behind returning to a beloved series, such as The Wonder Years, and reimagining it in a contemporary way with a beautiful chocolate black family um, while still remaining true to that period? Right. You know, I give Lee Daniels a lot of credit for having the foresight, you know, um, years ago, probably about five years ago, maybe when he first acquired the rights to the IP of the original Wonder Years. Um, and he said this before, he he knew that there was um, space in the, you know, history of um, TV and film that had not been occupied by a story about a black middle class family set during the civil rights movement. Mm-hmm. And, but he, you know, he, he admittedly says that he did not know what that show was going to be and didn't feel that he was the one to tell the story, but he knew that story had not been told. And so I was very fortuitous that he approached me to see if I could wrap my head around coming up with a take on it. Um, and, you know, I've said this before, my first answer was no, because of what you said, because of the you know, legacy and, and the, the place that the original holds in TV history, mm-hmm. I was like, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be the guy that messed up the Wonder Years legacy, and I don't want to be subject to just being, you know, said you just did a black version of the Wonder Years, you know, and um, and Lee and I discovered, you know, um, very early on that neither of us wanted those things, you know, he he was not interested in something that was just going to be derivative um, of the original, but he did want to like I said, tell a story and show a perspective about the civil rights movement that we, we really haven't seen on TV. We've certainly seen stories about the struggle um, and about, you know, the obstacles that the civil rights movement, you know, um, represented, I guess, the overcoming those obstacles and how the civil rights movement represented us as a people overcoming those, those mm-hmm. um, systemic obstacles. But, you know, those stories have been told and been told very well but there was also a black middle class that was experiencing those same things, those same struggles, but from a particular point of view. And I think Lee rightfully so saw that by using a black middle class family, there may be some commonality that non-black audiences can find 
um, in those characters that they couldn't find in other characters. And that commonality may be a way to then address, though, the same injustices and the same issues that Black people felt during that time. And so we, we realized we wanted it to be a reimagining. And so that freed me up to kind of base it on, loosely base it on my family and their experiences. Um, my first thing at 20th was like, are you guys okay with us setting this in the South? If we're gonna talk about Black people in the civil rights movement, why shy away from putting it you know, in the cradle of the civil rights movement, which is Alabama, which is where I'm from. And they were, they were on board with that. Um, you know, I think we, we benefit from having been developed at a time when they knew they couldn't say they weren't on board with that because of, you know, of how it would come across. You know, this was 2019. So it was before the George Floyd, you know, oh, wow. um, incident sparked the, the summer of racial reckoning. But all these things were still in the air in terms of, you know, the current day similarities, the unfortunate similarities between what we as a people were still dealing with in you know 2019 in terms of systemic issues and what we as a people were dealing with in 1968 in terms mm -hmm. of those systemic issues. So we just really felt that um, we couldn't pass up this opportunity to make, to make commentary about the present by looking at the past. So it's not an accident then that the, the <laughs> family is, is beautiful and chocolate. And I, I mean, the moment I saw Seikon, I was like, yes, yes. And then uh, I saw right. Laura and then I saw EJ. Yeah, and I was like, say that, say that again, please. And EJ <laughs> and Seikon. <laughs> you know? And EJ no, and, and Laura. And it's just, it just feels good, you know, as, as a person who came from a chocolate family, who was a chocolate person. Right. Like, I just, it's just, it just feels good. Like, was that sort of a happy accident? Was it intentional? Can you talk about it that? It was, it was certainly intentional. Now, you know, you know, I can I, I won't try to make it seem like me and Lee, you know, conspire from day one to say we're going to make sure everybody is, you know, is dark, dark, dark <laughs> chocolate. Um, but we certainly wanted to take this opportunity to both reflect our own personal stories. Like I said, it's loosely based on my family, my family members and their stories. And, you know, um, we, we wanted to see ourselves on the screen. And Lee and I have been very vocal. Um, you know, to the public about the fact that we both related to not seeing many people that look like us on TV screens and on movie screens, um, and not many Black people who look like us on TV screens and movie screens. Nothing against the Black representation that has been there, because we are grateful for that, you know, um, but there is something to be said about the diversity of our own complexions and things, mm -hmm. and, you know, how underrepresented people of a darker complexion have been. And so, in the casting process, we, you know, look, we cast far and wide, you know, um, Dulé was always my, my first choice for Bill. Saquon was the first actress that wowed us for Lillian. Nice. And so that kind of, and, and, and the fact that we were able to start there and then bringing EJ on, you know, I'll say it this way. Once we had one dark skin parent <laughs> and then we had a dark skin kid, we're like, well, guys, I'm just saying now, Everybody got to be dark skin because ain't no way that kid going to come from, you know, that mom and there's a light skinned dad. Right. You know, so <laughs> we were able to then kind of um, let things play out in a natural way. But, you know, um, Lee and I were both very conscious of the opportunity. Like I said, we had to, to, to show a family that hasn't been seen in this entirety, in this in this wholeness before. Dulé, are you feeling that, too? Or are you like, that's nice? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, of course. And I love the idea of. of well, one, going back to even the show being on the air, and <laughs> on the title of The Wonder Years, I really appreciate widening the lens of what The Wonder Years are. Mm. Yep. You know, we, I would, like I always like to say about this show is that this is a show a, about a, an American family. Yeah. An American story. Yes, it is about Black people. It's about African Americans. But we are America. Right. First yes. and foremost. A subset of America. Mm. We've Mitch McConnell may not think so. So what? McConnell may not think so. <laughs> you know what I mean? People are American. <laughs> yeah, right. You know what I'm saying? But I, I love the idea of taking something that was familiar and personal and widening the lens and, and, and presenting it again in a reimagined way, saying this is also the Wonder Years. This is also our story, the American story. And we also are a part of this nation. So I just I mean, I, once I knew that that was being done and I knew that it was being you know, under the, it was going to be in the hands of Saladin and Lee. And then once I knew even Fred was getting on, I said, OK, this is really a great formula for success. And if I can be a part of it, I would be honored. Mm -hmm. And even as they were saying of, of seeing people who look like us, 
you know, seeing the melon on the, on the screen is a beautiful thing. There's not a, there still is not enough of that, but hopefully this will be an avalanche of, a, of, the, of the next wave where it becomes, it doesn't, well, hopefully we get to a point where it's not a conversation. Right. That part. Oh, right. You know what I mean, but you got to take one step at a time and hold it. This is one of the major steps in that direction. And can I also say um, the black boy joy that we witnessed in EJ, yeah. just mm-hmm. living his life. Okay. <laughs> he, he fashions himself a comedian. <laughs> he's cracking jokes every day. And he's just, a kid he's just a happy kid and all mm-hmm. the co-stars when all the the kids are on set and they're all just crazy they're so full of energy they're just happily doing an amazing show and they're so excited and they're just bursting with energy it's really a joy to see it is and i think it's a good it's a powerful thing for that to be on tv every week growing up i did not see a lot of a lot of me reflected on the screen right 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 you know i mean yes you had different strokes, but that was a, a different thing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that was a different thing. Right. And yes, you had Webster, but that was a different thing. Oh, you know? Also a different those thing. Those were in the 80s. Those were in the yeah. 80s. That was a while ago. You yeah. Know I mean, you had Silver Spoons. You had Alfonso on there, but that was a different thing. Yep. Yeah, we family. had Malcolm Jamal Warner. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Huxables were one of the few, was like one of the few things that, that were out there. But to be able to see a family like us on the screen, it really warms my heart, seeing EJ, seeing all the kids, and knowing mm-hmm. that there are young black kids who are seeing themselves reflected on the screen is, is really a, a, a wonderful thing. Yeah, it was, it was great watching it with my kids, and my daughter saw Laura, and she goes, I was like, you look like her. She goes, I do, and I was like, you do, and she <laughs> just great. like lit up. It was the best. This is our city question, our wonderful sponsor. The question comes from the Paley Center's Black History Month celebration sponsor, City. What is the most challenging or exciting, unanticipated part of writing for the perspective of a 12 year old who is experiencing the world in many ways for the first time. How do you balance the innocence with the reality? So you guys kind of touched on that, but Mm -hmm. you know, how do you, how do you find that balance? You know, um, I mean, I'll start and do and say, even though it's a writing question, please do chime in because I mean, we've all kind of experienced the same discovery, I think in terms of the the power of some of these stories. Um, And this is also um, a way that Fred, Savage has been very helpful too, because again, you know, he he embodied a 12-year-old who was the, the lens that America saw adolescence and nostalgia through when, when he played the role. And he's been very helpful in helping us, you know, kind of um frame, you know, the point of view of our 12-year-old character now. But I guess to answer the question about what's been ex- exciting and challenging, um, the challenge is, and this is what we, you know, really hold ourselves to, always remembering that he's a 12 year old and really making it a point to write him as a 12 year old. And that sounds simple, but it's something that that's, that's actually, you know, difficult to pull off because most kids on TV sound like adults. Mm. Most kids on TV, you know, act like adults, react like adults, you know, um, that's just the way TV has evolved. And so we really want to keep our main character as 12. So there are things he just can't understand, you know, and the, the things that he, he shouldn't understand now, we had the benefit of having Don Cheadle voicing our adult main character, you know, and Don, you know, please, you know, give it up for Don Cheadle. I mean, you know, he he elevates everything he, he touches and, and, and this show um, just has a gravitas about it because of him. But so we, we had the benefit of him giving us a, an adult perspective and, uh, you know, reflection of what he's learned. But, you know, our 12 year old character um, is discovering that part of your life when the world as you've known it as a kid, which is everything is black and white, no pun intended, you know, good and bad, right and wrong, very, you know, delineated, where the real world starts to bleed in and you start realizing there's a lot of gray area, a lot of, you know, oh, uh, you know, um, I don't really know how I should feel about that. Or I, I, I thought this one way, but, you know, but now I see things, there's a different perspective, you know. Right. Um, and all those things, you know, are that's the challenge of protecting the characters of 12 year old, but it's also exciting because, and it gives us a great perspective to tackle some heavy things, you know, because mm-hmm. it is the loss of loss of innocence per se, but also just a 12 year old realizing, oh, wow, you know, this is people are not all good and not all bad. People have both of that in them, you know, and so we're able to make some commentary about very painful things about our history, um, you know, some difficult things. But, you know, through him discovering it, we're able to tell the world about it in a perspective that gets rid of all the weight that we associate to it, associate with as adults. Well put. 
I know yeah. Dule has something to say or say, God, I know you got something to say. <laughs> I mean, I think it's great. I mean, I, I don't really have much to add to it. Mm-hmm. Besides the fact of, I think when you're looking back on history, it it doesn't, it, there's always a lightness that is there. You find, you can find more humor that is there yep. and you have a, you're looking through a different lens. And I think it's a great device that the show uses of looking back on yesterday. So it allows some of that innocence to still thrive, to still mm-hmm. live. Inside of inside of Dean Williams and all the and all the, the children that are there, but uh, no, I mean Saladin and, and the writing staff they do a, a great job. What I love that they, they that they do is they touch on issues, but they don't. It's not a heavy hand, mm-hmm. but it's very powerful when it drops in. If you're paying attention, you're like, oh wow, you might have missed that one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, they just drop that one over you on you know on your way back over here, and then but then right on the heels of that, there'll be some humor that comes, or there'll be some something that. Light, like I said, elevates, lightens mm-hmm. the material. So, uh, yeah. yeah, they do a wonderful job. They definitely, they drop that thing in and then you'd be like, who was that? <laughs> Wait, did she say paper bag test? Excuse yeah. me. Like they'll drop, you know, they'll drop it in and you'd be like, huh? This is a great segue into the next question. Uh, the Wonder Years beautifully captures the bonds between parents and children. Given the show takes place in 1968, which you kind of ch- touched on, Saladin, mm-hmm. um, the struggle for civil rights certainly exists within the framework of the storyline. How do you strike such a fine balance between family narrative and what exists in the world, the world around them? You know, I want to let Dulé and Sekhan, you know, answer that just because um, I've been so proud of people's comments about how Dulé and Sekhan represent Bill and Lillian and the love they represent as, and the strength they represent as parents, you know, and for them to be able to channel that. I can't take credit for them channeling that, you know, they're actually tapping into things, I think, that speaks to that question. So I, I will certainly yield the floor to them. I, for myself, I'll say, uh, you know, being a parent really helps for myself, like being a parent in this time. What really impressed me about the show is the parallels of where we are today and what was going on in 1968. And as we talk about the, you know, la- the, the George, what happened last summer, even in the midst of all that, we still want to stay connected in love. We still want to mm-hmm. find moments of levity. We would still want to keep all of that on the outside of our walls. So that, yes, you would get in, you would talk about it and you have to deal with those emotions, but we didn't dwell there all the time. We still wanted to find joy mm-hmm. and create our very own wonder years. And that's really what this show does well. I think in the way that they've written the show. And of course, you get a chance to work with a wonderful Tony nominated actress like Saikon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It makes it very easy. But we're parents and we're trying to create a safe environment for our children, which is what I think most parents desire to do. They want to create this Eden in the midst of all the turmoil, in the midst of all the struggle that's going on the outside. You want to create this environment for your children to feel whole, to feel safe, and to thrive. And that's what I, you know, that's what I feel like we, we attempt to do as the Williams, and that's what I feel the writing plays mm-hmm. in on the show. On a, on a personal note, I, I have a high interest in uh, nutrition and wellness and self-care, especially in the Black community. I have a high interest in communication. Mm-hmm. And what I've seen that's really beautiful is we have so many conversations around the dinner table. Mm-hmm. And a lot of us live our lives stuck to our cell phones. Mm-hmm. And that time to engage with the children, engage with the, the spouse, mm-hmm. um, engaging with the grandparents, you know, that sense of family, um, that sense of eating, the, mm-hmm. the, to stop and take the time to eat together. It's very, very meaningful to me. And I think it's a good thing for us to see in this era. In the 2020s, we need mm-hmm. to be reminded to stop and sit down and eat. Mm-hmm. Take Point. time together and eat and talk and communicate. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, we make a lot of jokes about it, you know, when we're, we have our prop food or whatever. But just the fact <laughs> that we're together eating and talking. I think a, a lot of us don't do that as much as we used to. And I think it's a good reminder right. to maybe let people add a little bit more of that togetherness. Yeah. Great point. I, I love even when there was a birds and bees conversation, Bill was like, you good? Now we can eat dinner. Like, <laughs> it's like a great way to segue out of whatever he doesn't want to deal with. I need to eat. Like, right. <laughs> so dinner has like multiple purposes on the show, but you're right. It's, it is beautiful. It's, it's nourishment. It's nourishment. Mm-hmm. That conversation is nourishment. 
the what's going on at school and who mm -hmm. what your friend do your friend did what and <laughs> right. did you, and who's that boy and and getting in the kids business you know the parents the moms the dads the aunties the uncles the grandparents you got to get in these kids business it's important yep it is Dulé, this next question is for you. Your character is a rare TV father who works in the arts, specifically as a jazz musician. What are the gifts and challenges of exploring that aspect of your character on screen? And how does it inform Bill's relationship with Dean? I mean, I think the uh, the gift of it is I get a chance to explore it. I, I love the arts. I love being able to pick up different instruments, get a chance to sing songs, uh, Show, show that on screen too, that we can open ourselves up. And I consider myself an artist, you know, I've, I've come up in the arts and there are many, many people out there who are like me. And for myself, oftentimes I feel that art is my therapy. Mm -hmm. Just being able to have a, a place to express and release things helps me keep my sanity in the midst of this crazy world. Mm -hmm. So the idea of having that on screen and being able to share that with Dean and hopefully be able to inspire that in people mm -hmm. who view the show on the screen about exploring exploring whatever they're passionate about that that does give me joy the challenge of it is actually doing it because he's bill williams is so gifted <laughs> I mean, he's got the guitar he plays the saxophone he can sing you know so i look at some scripts i'm like okay okay so I go and try to learn this i mean you know, let's, let's try to at least do the best to make it seem like it's <laughs> that natural I'm really doing. yeah right. You know, uh, so that is that is the challenge. But but like all challenge or most challenges in the midst of the challenge, there still is joy. I love the pursuit of it. I love trying to figure out how to play the sax, how to play the song through the sax. I love like now on the set, I'm sure I'm getting on everybody's nerves because I'm always at the piano trying to learn how to play the piano. You know, I you know, when I found out that, that my character is singing at first, it's, it's very daunting. But then I love the idea of being able to go in. Get there. Yeah, let's sing this song. Come on, because there were like musicians are like they're the fabric of our community. Yeah. You know, artists. We mm -hmm. we are such a passionate people, a storytelling people, people mm -hmm. who think, people who dance. So having that on screen is really a having that reflected on screen in this way and are being embodied in Bill Williams is a wonderful thing. How does it compare to say your role as Gus on Psych or Charlie on West Wing? I think uh well, I mean, Bill Williams is just cooler. <laughs> <laughs> that, that alone. I love that Bill Williams is truly a man. He truly owns himself. Mm -hmm. He doesn't apologize for himself. He doesn't try to be overly, like overly a man, but he is very comfortable in who, in who he is. He, he's confident enough in who he is that he allows himself to be warm and to be loving and to be caring. Mm -hmm. That the, the fullness of Bill Williams is what I really appreciate as much as i love playing charlie young charlie really was young he, mm -hmm. you know even emotionally he didn't step into the fullness of who he was mm -hmm. gus i love playing the quirkiness and the wackiness of gus but gus also was very insecure about who he was mm -hmm. a lot of that was all just layered on top of his insecurity of just being you know into safe cracking and mm -hmm. not really knowing how to talk to ladies and all that kind of stuff but Bill Williams is like, this is me. This is me. And in the midst of this world, you have to know who you are. Mm -hmm. And I love being able to play that week in and week out. Yeah, right. I love when when Bill gives gives Dean the man card. <laughs> that was then, brilliant. That was brilliant. Takes it right he takes back. The boy card, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is the man card. It's brilliant. Say kind of, I also love Lillian and the episode, the workplace in which Dean visits your job and when you take your son at work day gave you an extra gave all of us an extraordinary window into her life and uh dean too and it gave us all a new understanding of what it's like for lillian to be dean's mom can you reflect on that episode and what it meant for your character and for you the actress playing the role man that was um of course that was a heavy work week for me that you know a lot of the scenes were focused on me and I remember um, just straight out the gate, the first scene we filmed, I was just like, I was stuttering really bad. I couldn't, there was this one word that I had to say and I could not get the word out of my mouth. And for me, my own work week, I was like, what is everybody thinking? You know, like having a self-consciousness of, you know, um, 
just being me, Saycon, being really self-conscious about what I'm doing right now. And I had to just get over it and attack the work at hand. And I think that's what Lillian does. And that's what she did in the episode. And I, I really appreciated um, the protectiveness that Dean showed towards the end mm -hmm. where they get home and he's like, move people, we just got mm -hmm. home. I love that. Um, and my favorite is the, the reenactment of football <laughs> <laughs> Just running up and down the hallway, mm -hmm. you know, with my uniform on, I had a ball. Okay. You were great with that. <laughs> great with that. Thank you. I was just, and I was filming all these little in-between takes. I was like, I was like, I'm gonna put this on my social media. I was like, <laughs> doing the Heisman pose. I was just doing, <laughs> just doing the most. And, um, it was just, um, it was powerful to present that. And so many people I saw online were like, my mom works that hard. My mom took me to work. Other people were like, my dad took me to work. Um, you know, just the fact that um, I was able to present that in the 60s and that so many people rep, uh, felt like it was similar to their experiences now mm -hmm. or their experiences even in the 90s, you know, um, or in the early 2000s, that mm -hmm. was um, really powerful for me. And uh, that was the first time I really saw some a lot of love for the character online. And, and if I might just add in, I mean, the the powerfulness of that story, because oftentimes you don't know the cost of what it is to be a working mother. Mm -hmm. So brilliantly written and Saycon played it so wonderfully and so beautifully. Like when you go back and you watch the episode, there's so many subtle moments in her performance. Mm -hmm. that the cost. And oftentimes we don't count the cost of what it is to be a mother. We don't count the cost of what it is to be a working mother, to be able to give all of your energy when you get to work, go above and beyond, and then come home mm -hmm. and give all your energy and go above and beyond. And how Saladin, you know, and how they did a great job of writing it was showing it through the lens of Dean when he came home. Mm -hmm. That was the first time he really got a chance to see like, wow, like this costs mom a lot to be mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that yeah. story was really one of my favorite stories of the season so far. And something about I those cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Something I was saying something about those cupcakes. When he was like, when he turned around to get the cupcakes and uh, the voiceover says something like, like she had time to, she made sandwiches and she got cupcakes. Right, yeah. <laughs> like, and he said, I'm starting to think mom gets up before 8 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's mama is up before 8 a.m. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Like, it's just, the writing was just so great. Yeah. First one up, last one go to bed. Yeah. Mommy life for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what I also love about this show, and we're going to wrap it up because I know you guys have other things to do. Um, but I, I just love to see Bill and Lillian's love for each other. Yeah. That bond. And they always come back to each other in like, the backyard parties and the HBCU ness mm -hmm. of it all. And just, it's just, it's, like you said, it's just layered. And if you're paying attention, it's just like a, a reward for paying attention. Yeah. You talk about what that's like to play those roles, to play Bill and Lillian, to have this wonderful, warm marriage and to sort of set that example without saying, see kids, look at us loving each other. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> they just love each other. I love that you said it was a reward layered in, you know, like just a few little words, a little some of this and some of that is just layered in. We had an um, episode where um, Dulé had this great scene. He's sitting at the lake and he's fishing and, and he's reflecting, you know, on the passing of Martin Luther King. Mm. And um, later in the episode. I love that episode. Yeah, it's a beautiful episode. And just the scene is Dulé and EJ there by the lake. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then much later on, we, we get to the house and we're laughing because he took to, he takes Lillian fishing. <laughs> this little fish is in the in the uh in the pan. And it's just it was just such a random little thing, but so funny and so heartwarming. And just the 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 kiki, the chuckling all around the again, around food, mm -hmm. around us with the food and the cooking and the ha 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 and they're like and the and you're seeing the two kids witnessing this love you know mm -hmm. i think it's really important just the witness to it all the witness you know mm -hmm. we've seen it in some i mean a lot of our favorite um films i think about um uh, eve's bayou where the little girl witnesses her father walking through the world as a doctor and all that and so seeing the kids witness that love is just 
I love it. I, it's it's really important. Um, and seeing the cuddle, that little picture made it in a couple of little news articles. The pictures, mm -hmm. the picture of the cuddle yeah. in front of the, <laughs> in front of the pan with the fish in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, for me, I, I, I guess piggybacking off of the witness of it all, I think imagery mm -hmm. is important. And the idea of that being on screen week in and week out, seeing a black man and a black woman love each other fully, yeah. wholly, through all of their good things and all of, and all the things that challenge mm -hmm. challenge each other, they're 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 connected with each other. And I, you know, I I don't think we see that enough. We've not seen that image enough on the screen. So I really take my hat off to Saladin for mm -hmm. creating this environment. But the thing is, I don't think it's as unique as it is made out to be. Right. Mm. I think away from television, there are many black couples who are there loving each other in the trenches with each other. They, yes, they have joyous moments and have challenging moments. They have arguments, they make mm -hmm. up, <laughs> you know what I mean? They get on each other's nerves. They mm -hmm. make love with each other mm -hmm. and they, they tackle the world together. They're a team. And Saladin has done a really great job of taking that and putting it, into our home every week on the network. I mean, I think that really is a is a is a wonderful thing. But really, this dynamic can't happen without the words, really and truly. If it's oh, not written that way, then it, mm -hmm. that performance can't come out. So I do take my hat off to Saladin, and of course, when you're working with Seikon Semblo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I, I got to say one other thing. I'm in these YouTube streets a lot. I love mm -hmm. just people. I didn't know you see bad streets. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this new phrase um, uh, that they talked about, uh, corrective promotion. And so mm. we, at how we are presented this show, this type of family, this this look, this writing, these topics, this household is a form of corrective promotion for Black people. And I'm, I'm really proud. I feel like we are like the kings and queens of corrective promotion. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I like that. I never heard of that before. I'm stealing it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for it. Mine. It ain't mine. I got no. <laughs> a particular YouTuber who said, Do it. <laughs> uh, Thank you for joining us for this special Paley Front Row presented by City with members of the wonderful cast and creative team of The Wonder Years. You can enjoy more of these programs by clicking on the subscribe button below. Thank you to Dula Hill, Saikon Sanglo, and Saladin K. Patterson. And thank you for watching. Take care. Happy Black History Month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.